Good evening everyone, time for another silver update. This is the monthly chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can click on the link below. Now this is the very, very long view. I've drawn in three lines here. The first line is the primary price trend line for silver going back to 2003. That's the beginning of this bull market. The other trend line I have here is the downtrend in the MACD culminating in where we are at today. And then this resistance line, which is the top that was reached at the Bear Stearns top. Now you can see we're trading at the same price that we were at the beginning. It wasn't even the beginning of the financial crisis. It was actually the hints of the beginning and we'll see when we look at the national debt how the crisis unfolded but it's very important to see the big picture here now if we want to look back and find a place where we were below the zero line and broke through that's going to be this very beginning of the bull market from that point in time we had a dip in 2008 but we did not go below the zero line so the bull market continued it wasn't until we actually penetrated in 2013 we broke down below and now you can see we're curving up so the only other example that we have in history of this type of move from below the zero point and moving up is going to be this point in time in 2003 so just real rough and simple math that gives us five bucks an ounce for silver moving to 50 bucks today if we repeat that same scenario we're talking about 20 bucks moving tenfold would mean 200 dollars silver that's the big picture that's the long-term view that's what we're looking at now that's the technicals we know that the fundamentals are the same or even worse because of the manipulation and the suppression and the rationing and all the rest of the shenanigans that the powers that be do uh, have made the situation much much worse since 2003 so it's quite possible there could be an overshoot there's no question in my mind that we are beginning to round up to a fantastic rally possibly the greatest rally in the history of this commodity that may actually dwarf this and that's going to give us a target price of maybe four or five hundred dollars an ounce once this thing really gets moving but let's look at the fundamentals I'm gonna take you to debt to the penny to show you the history but before we do that let's read this article from Simon Black on Zero Hedge Zero Hedge has been printing a lot of Simon Black articles lately Zero Hedge seems to have a lot of Simon Black haters. I've always liked Simon Black. He's been saying the same things I've been saying for a long, long time. So let's read this and then get back and look at the fundamentals of the debt and how bad it really is. Lessons for U.S. citizens from the deposit confiscation in Cyprus. It was almost exactly one year ago today that the an entire nation was frozen out of its savings overnight. Cypriots went to bed on Friday thinking everything was fine. By the next morning they had no way to pay bills or buy food. It's certainly a chilling reminder of how quickly things can change and why. The entire crisis sprang from a mountain of debt. The government had accumulated too much debt. The banking system had accumulated too much debt and banks had lost a lot of their customers money by making risky stupid bets on things like Greek government bonds. By March 2013 Cypriot banks were almost entirely devoid of cash. Sure customers could log on to a website and check their bank balances but there's a huge difference between a number displayed on the screen and a well capitalized bank that actually holds abundant cash. The government was too insolvent to bail anyone out and as a member of the Eurozone, Cyprus 
didn't have the ability to print its own money. Is that coming soon to the U.S.? I think it is. So they did the only thing they could think of, confiscate customer deposits. And they imposed capital controls on top of that to make sure that people couldn't withdraw their remaining funds out of the banks as soon as the freeze was lifted. It was a truly despicable act. But again, even though it all unfolded overnight, the warning signs were building for at least a year, especially the debt. When countries, central banks, and commercial banks accumulate too much debt, and specifically too much debt relative to assets, you can be certain there is trouble ahead in the system. Think about, think about it like your own personal finances. If you have a million dollars in debt, that seems like a lot, but if you own a home worth $5 million, you're still in good shape financially. And I would add that you're, you have a home that's worth $5 million where you can actually get $5 million. You can actually sell it for that, not what it's estimated at. If, on the other hand, you have a million dollar mortgage for a home that's worth $250,000, you're in deep trouble. The U.S. government's official on-the-books debt now exceeds $17.5 trillion. This is an enormous figure. If the Uncle Sam just happened to have $20 trillion or so laying around, however, this debt load wouldn't be a big deal, but that's not the case. By the U.S. government's own admission, their own financial statements show net equity, assets minus liabilities of minus 16.9 trillion dollars that's including all the assets every tank every bullet every body scanner every highway then you have to look at the central bank which is itself teetering on insolvency the federal reserve's balance sheet has exploded since 2008 and right now the fed's net equity assets minus liabilities is about 56 billion dollars that's a razor thin 1.34% of its 4 trillion in assets. It was 4.5% before the crisis. Here's the thing in its own annual report, the Fed just admitted that it had accumulated unrealized losses totaling $53 billion. This is almost the Fed's entire equity. So, in the land of the free, you now have an insolvent government and an insolvent central bank underpinning. A commercial banking system that is incentivized to make risky, stupid bets with customers' money. To be fair, I'm not suggesting that bank accounts in the U.S. are going to be frozen tomorrow morning. I'm not so certain about that. But a rational person should recognize that the warning signs are very similar to what they were in Cyprus last year. And there is one thing we can learn from Cyprus bail-in. It's that it behooves any rational person to have a plan B. Even if you think the future holds nothing but sunshine and smiley faces. Having a plan B can mean a lot of different things depending on your situation. Moving some funds abroad, securing a second source of income, having an escape hatch overseas, owning physical gold, holding extra cash, etc. You're not going to be worse off for having a plan B based on the possibility that there could be some problems down the road but if those consequences are ever realized and plan b becomes plan a it might just turn out to be the smartest move you've ever made if you think this makes sense and then he goes and promotes the site so fairly consistent from simon black now let's look at the debt to the penny because i want to review this this is the entire series here i've drawn it as far as it goes back this is the real numbers. This is the national debt. Now you can see here back in 1993, we're looking at about $4.2 trillion. And for the 90s, we had just that slow rise all the way through most of the 90s. You can see we're at $4 trillion, 95. We're at $5 trillion in around 96. We get to $6 trillion all the way up into the 2000s it takes us to get to that six trillion figure it actually takes us 
to 2002 to get to that figure. Then we stay fairly stable until we get up to about the beginning of the financial crisis. So we're going through 2003 now. It's rising at a normal pace, not a good pace, but a fairly steady pace through the supposed recovery of the Bush years. We're in 2004. You can see that we're going to hit that 8 trillion mark right there in 2005. So even during supposedly the most prosperous times, we're still rising and we're up to 8 trillion. Then around 2008 or so, the crisis begins. And you can see that we hit 9 trillion in September 2007 the official beginning of the recession was December of that year and we're sitting around 9.1 trillion we get to the Bear Stearns crisis and we're at about 9.4 trillion and then things go downhill into the summer and once we get into the fall we're hovering around 9.6 trillion in the fall of 2008 now, at that point, we get the financial crisis, and we get the stimulus, and we get the bailouts. And you can see we go from about $9.6 trillion on the 12th of September all the way up to $10.6 trillion on the 6th of November. So we get a $1 trillion increase in the national debt in two months it stays fairly steady there around that ten and a half trillion mark and then there's the election of Barack Obama Obama comes in and then his stimulus bill is passed and then they turn on the fire hoses so, so you can see we're about 10.7 trillion then we get into the spring we're up to 11 trillion and will go from the 9th of February on 2009 to a year later and we were at 10.7 trillion one year later we're up one and a half trillion dollars so by February of 2010, we're up more than one and a half trillion dollars. Go to February of 2011, and you can see we're at 14 trillion dollars. So we had a couple of years there where we we're putting 1.5 to 2 trillion dollars on the national debt per year. Now you can see we're still on pace. The latest is 17.5 trillion on the 14th of March this year. And if we go back to that same date last year, we're at about 16.7. So we're still putting about 800 billion dollars on to the national debt every year but we did have those years where we added about one and a half to two trillion dollars a year for a couple of years now my question would be where did that money go how was the economy improved where did the stimulus money go what benefits did we get from that money I I can't think of any and we know about the Solyndra scams and all the other scams that they ran that uh, were payoffs to friends and everything else. So you can see that we're still going on the course that we were on. A tremendous increase, nearly a trillion dollars a year of national debt. And that's what's going to fuel this. So if you think about the numbers that I showed you back in 2008, 
and where we are today and compare the price of silver to the amount of money that has been pumped into the system you can see that silver is undervalued just from this point to today we're talking about a 75 percent undervaluing so just based on the figures that we had at that time and where we are today silver should be eighty dollars but we know that based on this chart we're going to have probably the largest move in the history of this market once this MACD crosses over and begins to rise dramatically and we'll talk to you next time